Let's open with prayer. Father, we are thankful that you have given us voices to sing. What a beautiful thing it is to proclaim your praises. For that is what we are being prepared for to do through all eternity. Help us, Lord, to praise you even during the week. Because you are worthy to be praised all the time. Thank you so much for now giving us your word as we are. Open your word, help us to submit to the truths you have in store for us, and may your spirit open our eyes uh, to see and to submit to the truths you have in store for us today, so that Jesus Christ may be glorified in our life. In his name we pray, amen. Please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28, the church Bibles, it's page number 38. We started uh, surveying the first five books of the Old Testament a few weeks ago, and um, starting out with Genesis. Uh, so far, we've gone through seven messages in our survey through Genesis. Today is the eighth, and Lord, uh, Lord willing, there will be one more uh, before we move on to Exodus. Uh, and uh, today, we're going to survey the life of Jacob uh, from chapter 28, verse 10 is our text, all the way through uh, chapter 36 and verse 43. Uh, as the email goes out, I hope uh, you're reading these portions so you kind of get an idea of the flow of the passage. Obviously, in a time uh, uh, during the sermon, we can only cover so much. And even afterwards, uh, I would highly recommend you go back and read the portion, if possible, in one sitting so you kind of get, um, get the overall flow of the passage that was covered in uh, today's uh, message. Um, uh, the title, as you can see on the screen here, is uh, The God Who Elects and Protects. The God Who Elects and Protects. The reason uh, uh, that this title is given is because Jacob is one of those individuals early on in the Bible through whom we see the concept of divine election and God's sovereign grace. If you remember from um, last week, those of you who were here, um, as we uh, looked at the life of Esau, we saw the birth of uh, uh, Jacob and, uh, uh, and we saw the life of Isaac, sorry. Uh, we looked at the uh, two children born to Isaac and Rebekah, Esau and uh, Jacob. Um, and we noticed in chapter 26, verse 23, that God, while the children were in the womb, had um, divinely elected or chose Jacob, the younger of the twin boys, to rule over his older brother, Esau, contrary to the customs of the day. And uh, this choice by God, remember, was while the children were in Rebekah's womb, before they did anything good or bad. That's very important for us to understand. And uh, today, as we'll see, uh, uh, even though the life of Jacob, for the most part, uh, did not really demonstrate godly character. Uh, Jacob, uh, uh, this is not the model that when you talk about uh, uh, godliness. He had a lot of weaknesses. Um, but God still protected him. And through him, he continued the promises to further the promises that he gave to Abraham and Isaac. Uh, it goes to show how a sovereign God chooses people not based on their merit, but purely based on his sovereign love. That's very important for us to understand because it's a humbling truth. And people resisted that then, people resist that even now. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Romans 9 uses this very incident of God choosing Jacob over Esau to defend his sovereign election of people not based on any merit on their part. I'm going to read a few verses, so just follow along. Romans 9, verses 10 through 18, it's a lengthy passage, but Paul gives us solid defense in Romans 9 about God having the power and the freedom to do whatever he chooses to do. Look at me in verse 10. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, quoting Genesis 25 verse 23. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hate it, quoting Malachi 1, verses 2 through 3. What then shall we say? 
is god unjust not at all verse 15 for he says to moses i will have mercy on whom i will have mercy and i will have compassion on whom i will have compassion it does not therefore depend on human desire or effort but on god's mercy for scripture says to pharaoh i raised you up for this very purpose that i might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth therefore god has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden we'll talk about god's hardening when we lord willing work our way through exodus now paul as he said this he anticipates that people will resist this idea that's why he goes on to say in verses 19 through 21 these words one of you will say to me then why does god still blame us for who is able to resist his will but who are you a human being to talk back to god shall what is formed say to the one who formed it why did you make me like this does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use and the answer is absolutely yes the potter has all the right to do whatever he chooses to do and we can be sure whatever god chooses to do is always in keeping with his holy character so instead of resisting or arguing god's sovereign grace we must submit to the holy scriptures that clearly talk about the doctrine of election and in fact that doctrine is given in the scriptures for us so that we would praise him for purposes that are beyond our understanding in fact when when paul goes through this at the end of romans 11 verses 33 through 36 he ends this treatment of god's election god's sovereignty with a doxology with a praise he says all oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of god how unsearchable is judgments and his paths beyond tracing out who has known the mind of the lord or who has been his counselor who has ever given to god that god should repay them answer none for from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever amen romans 11:36 is a verse that believers should memorize meditate because this is one of the purposes for which we are called notice from him source through him the agency and for him the ultimate purpose for which all things are created that includes us so to him and if i can have the liberty to add him alone be the glory forever amen so be it says heaven so let's praise god for electing and protecting his own as we survey jacob's life a life that covers nearly 25% of the book of genesis let's pick up from chapter 28 verse 10 remember the setting jacob now with the help of rebecca had deceived isaac isaac was blind he has deceived isaac and he stole the blessing well actually the blessing was his but in a way he deceived his uh, uh, father isaac which resulted now in esau developing a deep hatred for jacob a hatred that would go to the point of planning his murder rebecca becomes aware of this So what she does is she convinces Isaac and Jacob for Jacob to go to be with her brother Laban far away and to obviously get a wife there and uh, that way uh, escape the wrath of Esau and hopefully when he cools down to bring him back but sadly Rebecca never sees uh, uh, Jacob after that uh, Isaac not only agreed to the plan but he also finally comes to grips with God's sovereign election he blesses Jacob as Jacob um, gets ready to leave that's all in genesis 28 verses 3 through 4 now uh, god starts to begin his work in jacob he's now on his way to meet laban and what did god first do in genesis 28 verses 10 through 15 jacob is on his way he's resting the night he's sleeping god comes to him in a dream and god now would restate the promises he gave to abraham and Isaac now he's going to restate that to Jacob because he's leaving the promised land so what about the promises that God gave so God's going to come to Jacob in his in his weak moment he's fleeing fearful so God comes 
to restate the promises, the promise of land in verse 13, promise of descendants, verse 14, promise of being a blessing to all people, verse 14, and then his abiding presence in verse 15. Follow along as I read verses 10 through 15. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set, taking one of the stones there. He put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it, or the footnote is a better rendering, there beside him stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your seed, offspring. I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Very important text in the Bible. We'll circle back to this later on. So Jacob wakes up from his sleep. He realizes God was present in that place, verses 16 through 17. So he takes a stone that he was putting his head on and he set it up as a pillar, poured oil on top of it and called that place Bethel, verses 18 through 19. Bethel means house of God. Then Jacob made a promise to God. Look at verses 20 through 22. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord, Yahweh, will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Jacob was not commanded to give a tithe. It was a voluntary offering. Tithing is not present yet. That only comes later for Israel when it's formed as a nation after the law was given. Now, when he reads... This portion, it seems like Jacob is trying to make a bargain with God. Uh, you, you bring me back, then I'll give you the money. Uh, but it, it's kind of hard to be uh, certain about that. There, there's, there's a love and faith that uh, I see Jacob displaying. Possibly it's a mixture because Jacob is still a work in progress. A work in progress. Uh, and then the story progresses in chapter 29. Uh, Jacob reaches uh, Paran Aram, which is a place located in modern-day Syria. Sometimes it's also called in the Old Testament as Aram, A-R-A-M. If you read that, understand it's in Syria today. There by a well, he meets uh, Rachel, Laban's daughter, who brought her father's sheep to water them. It's interesting. When Abraham sent his servant um, uh, to look for a bride for Isaac, it was by a well he runs into Rebekah. Perhaps the same well. Now Jacob runs into uh, uh, Rachel. Again, God sovereignly orchestrating all these things. And then as they talk with each other, they realize, uh, as they talk with each other, they, they realize, okay, we're family. And so she goes and tells Laban. Then he comes back to meet Jacob. And he takes Jacob, and, uh, takes, I'm sorry, takes Jacob home. A month later, Laban offered Jacob a job. So he understands the situation. Jacob cannot go back. So while he's here, he might as well work. And he asked him what his wages should be, verses 14 through 15. Now, by now, Jacob's already in love with Rachel, the youngest of the two daughters of Laban, older being Leah. So he responds, in the second, look at the second part of verse 18. I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban agreed to the conditions and had... Uh, uh, Jacob worked for him. Those, uh, those of you who have Rachel as a daughter, here's a way that you can get a uh, future son-in-law to work for seven years. I couldn't resist that. So. <laughs> I'm not sure if Rachel would agree with me, but uh, that, that's my... Uh, you like that. I kind of figured, James. Uh, uh, so at the end of the seven years, so Jacob said to Laban, verse 21, give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. Now when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. Now we start seeing the devious nature of Laban. We're seeing his character being 
revealed as well. You know, as the story progresses, what is interesting to note is we see how in Laban, Jacob the deceiver met his match. And think about this. What did Jacob do? In the dark, he deceived Isaac. In the dark, he is getting deceived now. Don't miss that. Don't miss the connection. Don't miss the connection. Let's continue reading the story. When morning came, there was Leah. It's like a shock. The, the, the reader is supposed to be shocked at this, of Jacob's response. Because he's, I mean, think about this in reality. It would have been a shock. It would have been a shock. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. My goodness, you can see this guy, right? That part, you don't follow, James. <laughs> so you see, you see that, what is going on here. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also. And now we see what follows here sets the stage for the battles and the misery in the life of Jacob. And his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. The author, Moses, gives us a clue of what's coming. And he worked for Laban for another seven years. Both Leah and Rachel would spend the rest of their life competing for Jacob's affection which would lead to greater resentment toward each other. I mean, you talk about sibling rivalry. It's as old as the book of Genesis. Cain and Abel, Esau and Jacob. Now you see Leah and Rachel in competition. And from chapter 29, verse 31, all the way to chapter 30, verse 22. Go home and you're going to read that. But this is what we read. Despite all these problems, Despite all these problems, God brought forth descendants from Jacob in keeping with his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and what he repeated to Jacob on his journey. Point is, God can work through all circumstances to further his plans. God is not thwarted by human sin, by human rebellion, or what we think are sometimes mountains. God can still plow through those mountains and accomplish his purposes. Not only his wives, Leah and Rachel, be involved in this process of bringing in the next generation, but also their servant maids, Zilpah and Bilhah. So one man and four women involved in the birth of a total of 11 boys at this point. Benjamin would be born later. 11 boys and one daughter, Dina, during this period. And in this time, keep in mind, 14 years have passed. Seven for Rachel, Seven for Leah. It's actually flipped. But Jacob thought he worked for the first seven years for Rachel. Actually, the next seven years also he worked for Rachel in one sense. Uh, and uh, so he's so far served 14 years for Laban. Now look at Genesis 30 verses 25 through 26. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me on my way so I can go back to my homeland. Later chapter says God tells him, prepare to go back. Give me my wives and children for whom I have served you and I will be on my way. You know how much work I've done for you. Laban in response, he tells him, you know what? I, he acknowledges, God has blessed me abundantly because of your presence. When there is a believer in the home, even if you're the only believer in your home, 1 Corinthians 7 talks about that. That home is blessed because of your presence. Don't underestimate your presence even if you are the only believer in your home. And I believe that also extends in the workplace. Jacob, uh, uh, Jacob here is there working for Laban and Laban recognizes that. That's the good point. Jacob himself says, God's blessed me because of you. And so naturally, you know, he doesn't want to let go. Who doesn't want to go, let go of a, a, a good employee who's basically married to his work and visits his home every now and then? <laughs> right? So that's, that's what is happening here. 
So Jacob says, I want to move on. But Laban says, no, I'll, he presses him. No, stay, stick around. So Jacob agrees to stay on one condition. Look at what he said in verses 31 and 32. Laban's question is, what shall I give you? Verse 31, don't give me anything, Jacob replied. But if you will do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flocks and watching over them. What's that one thing? Verse 32, let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark colored lamb and every spotted or speckled goat. They will be my wages. Laban agrees to this arrangement. And the rest of chapter 31 describes how God blessed and prospered Jacob's flocks. Some strange methods were used there, okay? But God blessed it. That's the point. And Jacob's prosperity brings a negative reaction. A reaction of envy from Laban and his sons. Again, family rivalry here. Jealousy. Genesis 31 verses 1 through 2. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. Envy rots the bones. One, of, one translation puts it as jealousy is like cancer in the bones. You cannot talk to people in love if you're jealous of them. It eats you up. You can put on a smile outside, but it just eats you up. That's what was happening here. And at the same time as Laban's disposition is changing, God is also starting to move to fulfill his promise. Remember the promise he gave him at Bethel? I'm going to bring you back. So God's starting to work that promise to fulfillment. Look at Genesis 31 verse 3. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives. That command is undergirded with what? God's promise of protection. I will be with you. I will be with you. Isn't that beautiful? From Genesis to Revelation, one of the things that God tells his people is, I will be with you. I will be with you. Notice God's command, uh, as he undergirds that with his promise, that's all Jacob has to work with right now. That's all he has to work with. But there's a belief there. Obviously he's concerned about Laban, but also he wants to obey God. So he tells his wives about the decision, and they all leave without telling Laban, fearing negative reaction and we are told in verse 19 Rachel prior to leaving stole her father's household gods shows her spiritual condition at this point it's really bad but even amongst this mess Jacob with all his weakness still holds on to God again don't miss that point when Laban finds out that Jacob had fled along with all his relatives he pursued them but just before they would catch up God warns Laban in a dream with these words in Genesis 31, last part of verse 24. Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Just stay away. That, that's really God's warning. Stay away. Don't mess with Jacob. Don't mess with Jacob. That's kind of the idea. So Jacob uh, sees Laban coming and Laban says, God already has warned me, which is another uh, way to encourage Jacob. I told you I'm going to be with you, right? Here's another proof. I can work in the hearts of people who are your enemies. I can work and change their disposition, disposition towards you. That's the power of our God. We underestimate that sometimes we look at the opposition. I cannot handle this. But we forget the God who fashions even their hearts. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. It doesn't happen all the time, but there are times it does happen. So that's what's happening here. So Jacob, knowing he was safe from Laban's attacks, poured out his frustration with Laban. Look at verses 38 to 42. Here's a man. He's built up a lot of pain and frustration. See what he says. Verse 38, I've been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself, and you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. That again shows the nature of Laban. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night, and sleep fled from my eyes. 
It was like this for the 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks and you changed my wages 10 times. Talk about modern day wage disputes. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac, first time we're, we're talked about this God is to be worthy to be feared, fear of Isaac, had not been with me, you would surely have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. What a harsh life for Jacob. Le leave aside Jap J Laban's deception. But what a hard life for Jacob here. The one who had all the comforts of his home, all this hard life, why? Because he took matters into his own hands and did not wait for the Lord. Don't miss that. What brought him here to Syria? He was forced to go there. Why was he forced to go there? Because he took matters into his own hands. I remember when I preached through Genesis, it was a two-part sermon, and I think the title when I was working through Genesis 27 and all that was uh, something like the, the dangers of taking shortcuts or something like that. And here we see 20 years later. More on that later on. Finally, both Laban and Jacob depart with a promise of neither hurting the other by erecting a pillar of stones. Jacob calls it Galid, verses 45 through 47, which means witness heap. Later, the place also uh, played a big part in the Old Testament narratives, a place called Mizpah, which means watchtower. So, one threat for Jacob neutralized as Jacob is moving back to the promised land. There's another threat that still looms. And what's that threat? Threat of Esau. The reason why he fled. Now we estimate with Esau. He doesn't know what's going to happen. So there's still a lot of fear. But when you're dealing with very angry and irrational people, you never know what to expect. Right? You don't know if the anger is prolonged, deep. or So he doesn't know. But again, he had only God's promise to cling to my presence with you. He's already seen that. That should have boosted his faith. But the kind and merciful God, look at what he does in chapter 32. Again, he sends his angels to encourage Jacob. God always meets his children at their weakest point. Don't ever forget that. Look at chapter 32, verse 1. Jacob also went on his way and the angels of God met him. Why did they meet him? To encourage him, God's present with you. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. He understands. So he named that place Mahanaim. Mahanaim has the idea of two camps. Camp of God, because angels are there, and camp of human beings, him and his family, and all are there. Again, it was a means to strengthen Jacob. How good and kind and merciful is our God. And verses 3 through 5, we read Jacob sending messengers ahead of Esau to update him about his arrival. And the messengers come back in verse 6 with the news that Esau was coming with 400 men to meet Jacob. Why 400? We don't know. But that's a large number to come meet with your brother. So, as Jacob hears this news, what happens? The old Jacob once again pops up. He's now applying his wisdom to handle the situation. This despite... God repeatedly reminding him of his presence. Look at verses 7 through 8, what Jacob did as a way of protection from Esau. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. So, notice something here. He's acting first. His own way of protection. And notice what he does next, verse 9. Then Jacob prayed. Don't miss the flow here. He acted first and then prayed. What should have been done? You flip, right? I'm in no position to criticize Jacob <laughs> because I find myself so many times and as I was typing this text, I paused. I still remember clearly in my office, I paused and I thought, that's me. That's me. So many times I've just acted and actually never even prayed afterwards. Jacob at least, he prayed afterwards. 
credit to him. Look at his prayer. Good prayer though. O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, the same Lord, Yahweh, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I'll make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you've shown your servant. He doesn't go to God demanding. He's going to God acknowledging, I am a sinner. I'm unworthy. I had on, only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid he will come and attack me. He's open and honest before God. That is beautiful. You don't have to pretend before God, Lord, I'm shaking in my boots. I'm afraid. I'm very fearful. That's what he's saying. I'm afraid he'll come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. It's an honest prayer, but also I want you to notice something. What Jacob is doing in his prayer is this. He is praying God's promises back to God. That's very important to remember in our prayers. Obviously, we don't misinterpret God's promises. We have to rightly interpret them. But in our prayers, it is good to pray scriptures back to God. That's what Jacob is doing. Lord, you said, and we can say the same thing. Lord Jesus, you've said you will provide for all my needs. Philippians 4.19. So based on what you have promised, I'm praying back to you. I have these needs. Pray God's word back to God. You can be certain you are praying according to the will of God. Because the will of God is revealed in the word of God. That's what Jacob is doing here. But despite praying, he again relies on his own protection plan. Again, how often we do that on our knees. God, do this, do this. And even before you get up, it goes back again to our own ways. That's what he's doing here. Verses 13 through 21, we read about Jacob selecting gifts for Esau, all kinds of animals, goats, rams, camels, bulls, donkeys, and that to a large amount. His motive, overwhelm Esau with gifts in a way to cool him off before he would meet him in person. I'll buy my way out of trouble. That's the worldly man's thinking. That's what he's doing here. I'm going to buy my way out of this. Look at his reasoning. That's recorded for us in the second part of verse 20. For he thought, I will pacify him. I will smooth him over under the table. I'll slide all these things. With these gifts I'm sending on ahead. Later when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. He had greater plans in his, greater confidence in his plans of dealing with Esau than in God's promise of protection. Sad, isn't it? Here's a man tossed tossed between, actually tossed between two camps, camp of unbelief and camp of belief. Well, what is sad is this, Jacob trusted God enough to leave Laban, but when the time of crisis came, he kept leaning to his old ways. It's like taking a step forward, then going back again. You had the faith, Jacob, to leave and to move towards the promised land. Why are you now taking a step back? But that's what he does. He makes all these arrangements. Verses 23 to 24 tells us Jacob sent his family. After he did this, he sent his family away with all the possessions. He stayed alone in the camp. We're not told why he stayed alone. What prompted him to stay? Maybe to think through stuff or to pray on his own. We don't know. And now, now is when God would really, really go to work on Jacob. Okay, Jacob. I've tried the soft touch. You're just not listening. I got to break you further. Verses 24 through 32 describe a very strange incident that people often describe as Jacob wanting to wrestle with God. But if you pay close attention, it was not Jacob who initiated this struggle, this wrestling. It was God. God is the one who initiated this struggle and then he would break Jacob and a broken Jacob would now cling to God. Follow along the strain of thought as I continue. Look at verse 24. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Who was this mysterious man? I believe it was none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. 
On what basis do I say this? It's based on Jacob's words in verse 28 and in verse 30. In verse 28, this mysterious man described Jacob. The mysterious man says, uh, Jacob, you struggled with God. He tells Jacob, you struggled. This man says you struggled with God, but his actual struggle was with, with this man. You struggled with God. And more importantly, notice what Jacob himself said in verse 30. So Jacob called the place Peniel, which means, as the footnote says, face of God. He said, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Now, why did Jesus, pre-incarnate Christ here, come to wrestle with Jacob? It was to break him. Break him of what? Break him of his self-reliance, break him of his scheming, so that he will learn to trust God wholeheartedly if God were to bless him now that he was in the promised land. You're in the promised land now. The point of being in the promised land is to trust me wholeheartedly, not lean on your own ways. I have to break you, Jacob, for your well-being. I have to take you through this ringer, so to speak, through this furnace, so to speak. And this physical act of wrestling was the way God chose to accomplish. Look at verse 25. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. That word touched has the idea of giving a strong blow. As a result of this blow, Jacob's hip was wrenched. Now, a physically broken Jacob would continue to wrestle with God as he realized this was no ordinary being. A broken Jacob would now cling to God because now he understood the secret to being blessed is first to be broken. We cannot say, God, I don't want you to break me. I just want you to bless me. The Son of God Himself learned obedience through suffering. It was not like Jesus was disobedient, that obedience reached its completeness, so to speak, through the path of suffering. So that's what we learn here. The secret to being blessed is first to be broken. To be broken. Now a broken Jacob desperately clings to God, or more specifically, the Son of God for a blessing. Look at verse 26. Then the man said, Let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Notice how the process of breaking continued. The man asked him, What is your name? Stop there for a moment. Didn't the man know what Jacob's name was? Of course he did. Son of God knows everything. But then why ask for the name? The reason for asking the name was to draw an honest confession from Jacob. Jacob needed to know and acknowledge who he really was. He needed to acknowledge and say it loudly, I am Jacob, the heel grabber, the schemer, the manipulator, the one who takes advantage of others to further my interests. Only upon that clear confession, God could move forward to bless him. A broken Jacob, physically broken Jacob, knew that. And that's why without any hesitation, he said, Jacob, Jacob, I am Jacob. I am this heel grabber. I am this schemer. I am this manipulator. True confession was integral for Jacob to be blessed. And that's the same for you and me as well. Until we honestly acknowledge and keep acknowledging before God who we really are, God cannot further his work in us. What is your name, God asks you and me. And we must be able to say, I am so and so, an adulterer, an angry person, greedy, never content with what I have, manipulator, schemer, bitter and unforgiving, proud and egotistic person in heart, a liar, a coward, lazy, stingy, untrustworthy person who never keeps his word, whatever it is, we must always acknowledge before God who we really are because he already knows who we really are. Until we confess, and again I add, keep on confessing regularly who we really are in our natural attitudes and actions which constantly seems to mark us because we don't always submit to the Spirit of God. We cannot expect God to work in our hearts. A broken Jacob did that as he now 
strived with God for a blessing. Notice what happened next, verse 28. Then the man said, your, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. He struggles with God. That's the idea. Struggle, contend. Because you've struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob's life has been a struggle from the womb. When you think about it. It's a new name. A name that will not only mark his new identity, but also the identity of a nation that God was forming through this one man whom he elected, through whom he would further his promises given to Abraham and Isaac. A nation from which ultimately will come the promised seed, the Messiah, to crush Satan's head as he promised Eve way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Jacob received the new name without any resistance. That indicates his submission to God. And notice what happened next. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Because you already know. You already know who I am. I'm God. Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face. Face of God he saw. Partially in the dark. He didn't see. That's why the man had to leave before the light came on because no one could see God face to face. He sees him partially. When Jesus came, his glory was hidden. He just opened up a little bit about of the curtain that he placed so that we can stand. In all his glory, when John saw him in Revelation 1, what happened? John fell flat. So it's a veiled way he saw the face of God. And then notice something else in verse 31. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. That limp would be a lifelong reminder for Jacob not to rely on himself but on the God who graciously elected him and also protected him all his life. Even though it would have been an extremely painful experience because physically to have that kind of a problem would have been very, very challenging if you meet Jacob in heaven and ask him, Jacob, do you regret that pain? You know what he would say? Absolutely not. Because I had to be broken in order to be blessed. No suffering is pleasant for the moment. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 12. It's painful, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who endure it, those who stay calm under that load under the training period not escape but endure because then they will see the fruit of a righteous life coming as a result of God doing something through that suffering God must first break us before he can bless us and continually keep breaking us so that he can continually keep blessing us as we are being made into the image of Christ and that involves suffering sometimes hard times hard times when repeated times of breaking comes, don't hesitate. Turn from your ways, the scheming and plotting and trusting. Turn and submit to God's ways, no matter how painful it might be. By faith, we must always accept God's ways. And a broken and blessed Jacob now is prepared to meet Esau, which is what chapter 33 is all about. And what, what, what we see in verses 8 through 9 is, Jacob did all this preparation. Everything he did to pacify Esau. But notice what happens in verse 8. Esau meets Jacob. Esau is asking, what is the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met? To find favor in your eyes, my Lord, Master, he said. It's almost like telling him, even though I stole the blessing, you're still my master because you're older than me. You're still my Lord. That, when you see a small L, sometimes it has the idea of a master, not necessarily a reference to God. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. All that scheming, all that trusting, all that fear, all the manipulation, everything. Didn't work at all, did it? Because God already changed Esau's heart. And God said, go, I'll be with you. You go. I'll be with him. I'll be with you. That's, that's. God tells us to stay or go. Whatever The issue is not that. Sometimes it takes faith to stay also. Esau refused, but Jacob presses him, so Esau accepts the gift. But he needn't do that because he already found favor in his eyes because God 
worked in Esau's heart. And as they part ways, Jacob came to the city of Shechem in the promised land, Canaan. He bought a plot of ground where he pitched his tent. And notice what he did in the promised land. Verse 20. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Which means El is the God of Israel or God or mighty is this God who is the God of Israel. It's, it's like a tribute. He acknowledges, yes God, you really are mighty. You paved the way. You took me through all these enemies that I had to face. You brought me safely as you have promised. But challenges come up soon as he, as he uh, enters the promised land. They go to this place called Shechem. The ruler of Shechem has a son also by the name Shechem. And he looks at Dina. He, he lusts after her. He rapes her. And then he wants to marry her. So Jacob's sons come up with a plan. The plan is... They say these people, well, you have to be circumcised in order to marry our sister. And as the men in the city agree to that, what happens? When they go through the circumcision and they are in pain, Simeon and Levi, two of the sons, go and slaughter all the males. They take all the women, all the possessions, cattle, everything. They take all of that. And uh, later in Genesis 49, we read they even hurt innocent animals and Jacob feared retaliation from the neighboring cities so what did he do chapter 35 verse 1 then Jacob God said to Jacob go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau takes him back that circle now it's come back a circle back to Bethel notice what Jacob did in response when he came to Bethel first of all he should have gone to Bethel why did he even stay in Shechem that itself was a wrong thing. Because God said, I'm bringing you back. He should have gone, proceeded on to Bethel. He didn't do it. So he faces consequence for his disobedience. Verse 2 of chapter 35. So Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So, Jake, so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Notice what God did in response. Then they set out and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. Again, notice the connection here. God could have put this terror even in Shechem, protecting Dina. Why does he do it now instead of before? Because of verses 2 through 4. What happens here? They're now committing themselves fully to God. Get rid of all that garbage in your life. You cannot hold on to these sinful things in one hand and then expect God to be on your side. Yes, God, despite those things, continues to show mercy to us. But if we want to see God work in us, we cannot hold on to these things. Get rid of them. That's why Jacob says here, get rid of all that garbage. I've put up with that enough. Get rid of it. Let's make a clear, let's a clear commitment. A consecration. Set apart people should live like set apart people. Let's live like that. And then they see God go to work. We cannot keep holding on to those pet sins and expect God to work. Verse 6, Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel, God of Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. What a promise keeping God. 20 years it took, but God kept his promise, didn't he? Brought him back. Brought him back. With descendants, as he promised. Not only that, God once again repeated his promise, promises to Jacob. Look at verse 9, after Jacob returned from Paddan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, he who grasps the heel, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel, he struggles with God. So he named him Israel, El is God, the God of Israel, the God with whom the nation contends. That's why you have those names, Danny El, Misha El. Israel or Isaiah, Yah. It's another intimate way to refer to Yahweh, Yah. 
So that same lot of times in the Old Testament Psalms, you'll have it as Hallelujah, praise Yah. That's the idea. So once again, it reminds him, remember who you are now. Remember who you are. We need to remember who we are as we walk in this world. We are Christ's own. We are Christians, followers of Christ. Remember the name you got, the new identity you got at the time of conversion. Don't forget that. That's God's reminder to us in verse 11. And God said to him, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Promise again of community of nations, descendants, land, everything is repeated and in response Jacob set up a stone pillar at that place poured a drink and oil offering and called the place where God talked to him as Bethel meaning the house of God the rest of the chapter explained the deaths of Rachel who died giving birth to the twelfth son of Jacob Benjamin and also describes the death of Isaac listed also in this chapter are details of Jacob's twelve sons from which the later part of the scriptures teaches would come the 12 tribes of Israel. If you look at the chart that's there, it shows you from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, the 12 sons that come. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. And we see people like Moses and Aaron come from the tribe of Levi. But if you notice Judah, is from Judah, later comes David, and from David Solomon, eventually the promised seed, the son of God himself, Jesus Christ in from Benjamin would come King Saul and later the one we know also as the Apostle Paul. It shows, that chart shows us a faithful God. Once again, gives proof that he keeps his promises. And chapter 36 gives a list of Esau's descendants from which would come the nation Edom, which would be a continual threat to Israel. And later at the end of chapter 49, we read about Jacob dying, but that's for the next time so, quickly we've seen, this is like drinking water from a fire hose, fire hydrant, right? But hopefully you see the connection there. You go home and read, you can see progressively how the story uh, comes along. But that's, as we survey this, this life of this man, Jacob, renamed Israel by God, allow me to briefly share with you two life lessons. Two life lessons. Life lesson number one, we will reap what we sow. We will reap what we sow. The Apostle Paul tells us, warns us in Galatians chapter 6 verse 7, do not be deceived. Notice he starts out by saying do not be deceived because we will deceive ourselves thinking somehow I can do whatever I want and get away with it. No, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. He uses an agricultural metaphor to teach us a spiritual principle. We will reap what we sow. We see this truth evident in Jacob's life, don't we? Deceived blind Isaac, as a result, flees from home, ends up in slavery to Laban, who deceives him, what? In the dark. And later we will read how his own sons deceive him about Joseph through a coat that he made specially only for Joseph. Parental partiality, never good. Deceiver meets his match in Laban, yet another deceiver. What a hard life it must have been for Jacob, who had the comforts of living indoors. 20 years, sun beat me down. The cold crushed me. Wages, you changed. It was a brutal life for Jacob. And listen to his words as he stood before Pharaoh Years later, in Genesis 47, verse 9, Jacob said to Pharaoh, as he looks back at his long life, the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. His pilgrimage. And then he says, my years have been few and difficult. Another translation puts it as hard. And they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. Our life on earth is a pilgrimage, but sometimes we can make it so hard because we don't trust God, we trust in our own wisdom. Hard life because he failed to wait on the Lord. God, you've promised me, you will bring it to pass in your time. I don't need to grasp, I don't need to manipulate, I don't need to work the situation through deceptive schemes and get it 
And yes, sometimes God will give it to us. We may feel, oh, I succeeded. But with that comes a lot of pain. A lot of pain, a lot of heartache. And you know, we might not be able to say it to others, but we know how we got something and that nags us. That guilty conscience prevents us from enjoying fully the blessing he has given to us. It's a life of regret. Yes, God in his mercy carries us. But it's a warning for us. We cannot go back in time and change how we wish sometimes we can. But what we can do is have a new beginning today. Knowing that I'll reap what I sow. So what am I sowing? To the spirit, meaning to a life yielded to the spirit of God, or to the flesh that may give me satisfaction in the short term, but in the long term it's always pain. Always tears and frustration. We will reap the bitter fruit of unbelief, even as God's children on this earthly side, because there is no suffering on the other side for the believer. Judgment begins at the household of God, Peter says in First Peter. What will happen to those who are not? But judgment does start in the household of God. God's message to us through the life of Jacob, one message is that we will reap what we sow. Second life lesson is God, notice, is not ashamed to be the cause to be called the God of Jacob. This is of comfort. Despite the many failures of Jacob, God of the Bible is not at all ashamed to be called as the God of Jacob. Over 20 times in the Bible, we see God described directly as God of Jacob. Not just the God of Abraham and of Isaac. Psalm 46 verse 5, one of those references says, Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob. You may think, I messed up. How can God help me? Hey, hey, understand. The psalmist says, he's the God of Jacob. He's the God of Jacob. Blessed are those whose hope is in this God, this Yahweh, their God. It shows how much God loves sinners, no matter how weak and frail and sinful we are. We all possess the spirit of Jacob in us. Let's be honest. Some to a greater degree, some to a lesser degree. But it's comforting to know that even though we fail, we don't need to stay away from God. He welcomes people like that to come back to him. Jesus died for all our sins, the sins that's still future for us. Remember when Jesus died on the cross, all the sins we would commit were still future because we were not even born yet. That's the kind of God we have, the God of Jacob, so comforting, so reassuring. None is beyond God's saving grace. This means if you are far away from God, you can still come, find forgiveness for your sins without the fear of being turned away no matter how much you've messed up. That's the good news. That's the good news. Jesus took the punishment on that cross for all who are willing to turn from their own efforts, from their own manipulative schemes to get right with God and just accept his sacrifice on that cross so that they could be forgiven and become a child of this God who describes himself as a God of Jacob. And once you come, you'll realize you came because this God, this God of the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, this God of Jacob, elected you in eternity to past. He chose you in eternity to past to be united with his Son by faith. That's why you came. And it's the same God who not only elected you, but also has promised to keep you safe to the very end as you stay in the hands of Jesus. Those nail-pierced hands, you're secure in his grip. It is this God of Jacob who said, who's told us that I've started the good work in you. I will complete it. I will raise the, all that you've given to me on that last day, says Jesus. That's a promise. So this God, this God is the God to whom you can come again and again. And now, we saw a little bit of how Jesus fit in this picture, but th th there's a lot more how Jesus fits. So I'm going to close with this for the next five minutes or so. Just focus, please. I know the message is going a little longer, but to keep the continuity of thought, I went through this portion in one sitting. So go back to Genesis 28 for a moment. Look at verses 12 through 13. Please bear with me. Verses 12 through 13. I glossed over when I read that earlier. This is Jacob as he's leaving 
Canaan on his way to Syria at Bethel. He, he's tired. He's putting the stone, putting his head and sleeping. Notice verse 12, it says, He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were descending and ascending and descending on it. There above it or besides him stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are, li which you are lying. Think about this. Genesis 11, the people build a tower. Right? They build a tower to ascend the tower to get to the gates of God. There was a ladder here. God himself is building. And notice the one major difference. And as God built this tower, he comes down to meet Jacob, a man filled with fear and uncertainties, a man who was a heel grabber, not to curse him, but to comfort and bless him. I will be with you. I will fulfill all my promises. Jesus, in John chapter 1, verse 51, when he met Nathaniel, said this very truly, I tell you, the you is plural, you, y'all, will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What is Jesus saying? I am this ladder. I am the one who has come down from heaven. You cannot come from here up there. That's why I've come down to take you up there. It's Jesus here. It's the ladder, the link between heaven and earth. And because we cannot get from here to there on our own, the Son of God came to take us to be there by living a life that you and I can never live. But dying the death, the only perfect death, as our substitute to pay for our sins, to take us there. Jesus himself said later in John's Gospel, in John 14, verse 6, that very familiar statement, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the only ladder through which sinners here can get up to there, the holy place where God dwells. Not only do we see Jesus in the story of Jacob here, but when we look at the overall teachings of Scripture, we see Jesus so much greater than Jacob. You know, in one of the uh, early incidents in G uh, Jesus' life, we're very familiar with it. He meets this uh, woman at the well, the, the woman in Samaria. And uh, as, as the discussion was going on, she posed an interesting question to Jesus in John chapter 4, verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob? She asks. Are you greater? You know, the Bible's resounding answer is, yes, Jesus is far greater than Jacob. Allow me to show you this contrast or this, this, this way to validate the statement that Jesus is indeed far greater than Jacob. And with that, we'll close the message today. Jake, Jacob, we see, full of greed and deceit. But Jesus, on the other hand, John 1.14 tells us, was full of what? Grace and truth. Jacob grasped for the blessings of God by tripping his brother. Jesus, we are told, even though he was existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. What's the idea of emptying? Laying aside his privileges. That's what it means. He didn't stop being God. He set aside the use of certain privileges by taking the form of a slave, by being made in the likeness of men. Look at the contrast. The son of Jacob here, the son of Isaac, wrestled alone on a dark night to gain a blessing for himself. Bless me. Genesis 32 was Jacob's cry. But Jesus, in Matthew 26, 39, on that other dark night in Gethsemane, wrestled alone with his face to the ground to gain a blessing for you and me. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. If your will is for me to die for the sins of others, let that be done. Jacob saw the face of God in the person of the pre-incarnate Christ in a veiled form. But you know what the Bible ends with? This promise that all who put their faith in Jesus, we will see the unveiled face of Jesus in all his glory in the future, in the new heavens and new earth. Revelation 22 verses 3 and 4 says this, No longer will there be any curse, 
the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants, his slaves will serve him. They will see his face. That's the promise. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. What is your name? The angel didn't answer to Jacob's question then. But his name will be stamped on our foreheads. We will see Jesus who is the image of the invisible God face to face all eternity. This same Jesus whose face we read upon which people spat that same face that people struck their fists with put a crown of thorns same face they would wrap in the tomb with a face cloth the same face that would appear to the disciples on the third day is coming in glory to set up God's glorious kingdom. And he has promised all whom he has chosen, all whom he has elected, his sheep, that he will protect them till the very end so that they will see his face in the future and bow down and worship him for all eternity. Is this Jesus your Savior, your Lord? If not today, bow down and ask him to make you his follower. If he is, continue to say, God, help me to not lean on my own understanding, but to trust in you with all my heart. You will direct my steps. I believe in that. And when doubt comes, turn my eyes back to the cross where it was you who went through all that for me so that I can see your face, that glorious face for all eternity. Lord Jesus, seal these truths to our hearts because you are worthy to be trusted. You are worthy to be followed all the days of our lives, even if it means shame and disgrace and pain and even loss of life, physical life. It will still be worth it, Lord, because you are worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all your mercies. Thank you for being the savior of Jacob and all of us who are like Jacob. In fact, far worse than Jacob. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your gracious gift of salvation. In your name we pray. Amen.